meet. And one side didn't know what the other side was doing and they wanted more collaboration and they needed an a agnostic body to head it up. So nobody from education and nobody from government, but a neutral party. And so our founder and president, Scott Young, kind of raised his hand and we started California Cyber Hub. We made a lot of progress with California Cyber Hub, including a statewide competition that um, happened in 12 different places on the same time and lots of good collaboration and effort in California Cyber Hub. And when we expanded that outside of California, we became, uh, we brought that under the umbrella of Cyber Guild. Unfortunately, we couldn't get cyber hubs because cyber hub is a term that's used for too many things. So that's my background. And what I am bringing to you guys today is just some nuggets on cybersecurity and some things to know. Um, many of you are techs and in the industry. So hopefully some of what I'm going to present is something that maybe you haven't heard before or aren't aware of. And that's kind of my hope and um, talk about some of the things we're involved in. Um, what you were looking at earlier is a cyber uh, threat map. So there's threat maps you could look at with FireEye. Um, the one I was showing you was Kapersky. I kind of like Kapersky because it shows the type of attacks, whether it's a, a DOD or a, a denial of service DOS or um, a ransomware attack. They show what kind of attacks are happening. The bottom line is that the industry continues to increase. 2019 had 273% increase in cyber breaches. And that was 4.7 billion records exposed as cyber uh, uh, breaches continue to be on the rise and increase. Um, it's not going away. It's only getting worse. The COVID-19 situation has made it even uh, more challenging and made companies even more vulnerable as employees have moved to their home offices and now you have another point of vulnerability in your system. So if you look at the threat spectrum, and I don't know if you've seen this chart before or not, but this really talks about the type of threat actors there are from the hacktivists who are um, politically or socially motivated all the way to the nation state actors that are motivated by um, war and sabotaging other nations. Um, cyber crime is really the number one type of uh, breach is those that are looking for payouts and profiting from the hacking. If you look at the percentage, um, cyber criminals make up about 30%, hackers 25%. Um, you can see the other things there. I want to point out, I went to an FBI briefing um, just before COVID-19, so back in March, I went to an FBI briefing where they talked a lot about the China threat. Um, China and Russia are the top two nation state threats, but China is playing a long game and they're patient and they're purposeful and they have a plan. And they have plans called the Thousand Talent a program to um, leverage Chinese nationals that are studying in America and doing research in America. Um, China basically has a policy that if you're a Chinese national, you are obligated to share any secrets and research that you learn about in other states and share it with the homeland. Um, through that, they are stealing our technology. Their plan is to become the world power, superpower. And their goal is to steal intellectual property, start to manufacture it art themselves at lower cost and put the United States out of business, put your companies out of business. And some examples of what they've done is they've stolen the complete design and build plans for the F-35. That's our new top fighter threat. They've even actually built a version of the F-35 with improvements to the US version. Um, they don't plan to manufacture because they can't do it cheap enough, but now they know how to um, attack and fight and defend against our top uh, fighter plane. Um, other examples is they used a Chinese national who was a professor at a university in Texas and had him start up a company, a fake company, hire away talent from the one company that made the technology that makes our submarines uh, quiet and um, they've been able to steal that technology. And that has actually been uncovered and a lot of the players have gone to jail 
but those are some examples that they've done. Um, universities are under big attack from China. You might remember the Harvard professor that got arrested for stealing uh, research secrets and classified information with China, and that's a perfect example of what they're trying to do. Um, just last week, the FBI Director Ray reported that all of the FBI field offices across the country were working on cases. So this is not segmented to only one part of the country or only certain size um, businesses, but there's actually one investigation open to every 10 hours that involves Chinese espionage. So protecting our information against China is key. And they have, um, I don't think, I think I moved it to backup slides, but they do have um, a plan for attacking, uh, attacking our biomedical companies. There's huge amounts of attacks against anybody doing COVID-19 research. Um, the financial industries, and they're also building a very large database so they can leverage people that are in vulnerable situations. So what kind of attacks are most common? Um, you've seen all these, you guys, some of you are in the IT uh, service provider business. Um, phishing is still top on the list. Uh, Verizon just released their 2020 uh, it, gosh, it looks, it's right here, the 2020 Data Breach Investigative Report, the DBIR. And phishing is top on the list for the, the type of the methodology that threat actors are using to get into companies and steal information, which really leads back to training for your employees. Um, this is another one that uh, shows business email compromise as California, we're a high tech state and you could see pretty much in every time you see a map of the United States like this with the number of breaches or the number of attacks or the number of email compromise, whatever it may be, California is always significantly above everyone else as far as the number of attacks. So we happen to be in a state that is is targeted and that's something to be aware of. Um, again, on the business email compromise, some things that I learned from the FBI briefing, one of the, and this happened to our company, a very common attack is um, one where the threat actor will send an email to a manager of the company, which they've done through social engineering, they've gotten information or they'll send, they'll send an email to a financial person in the company saying it's from the president and asking them to make some financial transaction. So an example is we had an employee get an email from supposedly from our president asking her to buy 20 $100 Apple um, cards, gift cards. Not a huge amount of money, but it was such a thing she went ahead and did it. And later on, we realized we had to implement better policies to verify emails and transactions. And the FBI, at the FBI briefing, a manager said they made large uh, electronic fund transfers for paying their customers and somebody intercepted and gave different bank information for that money and the money went to a bank like somewhere else in Texas or something like that. They were able to uncover it and retain, get the money back, but that's an example of the type of hits that they're getting on uh, businesses in the financial realm. Um, Synod, our company is part of an effort by the state and the Department of Defense called Cascade. Uh, the DOD's Office of Economic um, Administration offers grants to each of the states to bring about resiliency. Um, our project in California is focused on cybersecurity resiliency. Um, both Synod and uh, Cal Poly are involved in the effort. It is a collaborative effort with 15 different projects. Um, how many of you, just out of curiosity, are any of you doing DOD business? You could be a sub to a sub, um, like Next Intent and Trust Automation, both supply to the defense industry. Well, in any case, in the defense industry, something for you to be aware, or if you're a service provider like Clever Ducks and Digital West and you're providing services to somebody who is in the defense industrial base, it's important to note the compliance requirements for cybersecurity. 
um, the DFAR 7012 clause was implemented in 2015, and it regards what they call covered defense information or controlled unclassified information. And basically it says you have to protect it. If there's any cyber incidents, you have to report it. It basically calls out NIST 800-171, which is a list of, I think, uh, uh, Amy or Jeff, maybe you know, it's 100 and something controls for NIST 800-171, but those are the cybersecurity controls provided by the NIST standard. Um, the way that DFARS was rolled out is they allow companies to self-attest. Basically, if you sign a contract and it's a, it's a flow down from the top of from the primes to, and there's 14 layers in the defense supply chain. If you sign a DOD contract, you're self-attesting that you meet the DOD or the DFAR 7012 clause. It's determined that over 95% of our defense suppliers do not meet this compliance requirement, over 95%. And I've heard as high as 99%, but I'm being conservative by saying 95%. So it's a concern that the uh, information is vulnerable to, especially our, the nation actors who want to steal the IP. Um, because of that lack of compliance, they, uh, the Department of Defense released the CMMC. Has anybody heard of that? Just say yes if you have. It's the Cybersecurity Mod Maturity Model Certificate. CMMC. And compliance re is requirements exist not only in the defense industry, but also in financial and um, healthcare. So healthcare, it's HIPAA, for example. Um, the CMMC, Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certificate, is a new compliance requirement that's going to be rolled out by the DOD and replace the DFAR 7012 or it be a supplement to it. Um, currently, they're planning on rolling out five contracts requiring the CMMC certification. The difference is, as I mentioned, DFARS was self-attestation, and CMMC requires certification by a third-party um, assessment body. And currently, they're working on developing what that infrastructure is for the, the third-party assessors, um, how to control it, how to verify, how to how to certify that the assessors are official, and that process is being developed. Now, the reason why I mention this, not only because we're part of it, but I mention this because even if you are not pro part of the defense industry, perhaps you're financial or healthcare or just other business, the, um, there was a commission developed, a group developed called the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. It includes U.S. Senators and U.S. Representatives, as well as some cybersecurity experts. They just released a report in the last couple of weeks with recommendations for securing our nation from cyber threats. Um, our United States government recognizes that we are at severe risk from, for cyber threats and that we aren't doing enough to do it. But one of their recommendations is to establish a national cybersecurity certification and labeling authority, which is basically what CMMC is for the defense industry. Um, if any of you are interested, I could send the report, the link to the report and the report summary out to you for those of you who would like to read it. But the important thing for you to know as a business is that it's coming. It's, it's a compliance requirements for running a business in the United States for cybersecurity um, protection is going to be coming down the line as the nation implements more compliance across our nation. So our project is part of Cascade. I mentioned that there's 15 projects. Um, Cal Poly's projects all revolve around securing space. It's kind of a side project. But half the projects in the Cascade, which is the California Advanced Supply Chain Analysis and Diversification Effort, half of the projects have to do with educating the small to medium businesses and manufacturers on what those DFARS requirements are, running assessments, providing boot camps, et cetera. 
In fact, today, uh, Chris Boothy from CMTC, which is the, um, uh, what they call the MEP, the Manufacturing uh, Employment Partner, I believe, that helps support um, the defense industry in for California. They run baseline assessments, their project for Cascade is to run baseline assessments. So if you are a company who and you are, have, you do have at least 5% of your business servicing the defense industry and you're interested, they do have some slots open. Um, we're already working with a couple companies on the Central Coast through the connections with Cal Poly and Sened. So if you're interested, let me know. Um, but the other half of the projects have to do with the talent supply, the workforce development. In Cascade One, the first round of funding, they did a research project to look at the supply of cybersecurity talent versus the demand for the talent. And CyberSeq, which is from Burning Glass and CompTIA's research, so Amy's very closely tied to the research done by CyberSeq. CyberSeq updates their website twice a year with the data of open positions. So you can see that as of December 2019, there were over 72,000 jobs in California for cybersecurity. That's basically 1.5 jobs available for every existing cybersecurity person in um, California. It's nice because you could see over on the right, it'll tell you the top cybersecurity job titles. It'll also tell you what certifications are most requested. Uh, CISSP is often requested. Um, this is important because the Cascade One research project I mentioned, which was done through the governor's um, business and economic development department, found that there are 64 degree, pro, degree or certification programs in the United States, in California, sorry, in California, there's only 64 programs that offer a degree or certification in cyber or that focus on cyber or touch on cyber. And that produces only 3,600 new talent every year. So 3,600 for 72,000 open jobs. And the challenge in the industry is that most companies want to find people with experience but we can't grow the talent pool if everybody wants them to have a CISSP with five years of experience or more. Because what happens is everybody's just poaching the same talent and we're not growing new talent. So our project 15, thanks Brian, our project 15 is basically working on fulfilling that, uh, filling that experience gap and finding opportunities for on the job work-based learning or apprenticeship programs for entry level candidates coming out. So again, if any of you are interested in looking to hire and offer internships or apprenticeships, take an apprentice, then reach out to me and we'll get you connected with our Cascade project. So I have a couple more slides. I only have five minutes. These are 10 cybersecurity tips for small business and I will provide these slides to Brian that he could send out to you. I'm not going to go through them in detail. Probably a lot of these you guys have heard. Um, I mentioned phishing attacks is the, the top um, type of attack this year or the methodology. And number one to fight against phishing attacks is to train your employees. Obviously, they talk about always running your backups. I think what oftentimes gets forgot is that in, we're in a whole different world now with COVID, but the remote worker, um, one of the colleges that had a major breach was breached through somebody's um, laptop that traveled a lot and they didn't run the security updates on laptops. So you want to make sure as you're developing your plans, you're keeping in mind mobile phones, you're keeping in mind the laptops that are taken home to people's houses and making sure that those security updates and firewalls are getting in place. Um, the other thing that's real interesting as I mentioned, as part of Cascade, CMTC does training. One of the things they share with companies is that multi-factor authentication will stop 99% of uh, malware attacks. So just implementing uh, multi-factor authentication can protect your system from those certain types of accounts account, attacks. So, Consider implementing that. And again, I'm not going to go into the details, but there's top 10 here. You could find them on the internet all over the place for top 
requirements for implementing cybersecurity policy. Um, my hope is that what you get out of this is recognizing that cybersecurity is a serious threat and hopefully that you progress in your own business practices to becoming completely cyber security resilient. Um, whether you're just at the level of understanding that it's a threat to all the way becoming uh, implementing changes and policies and procedures within your company to meet that cyber resiliency. I hope that by today, at least I got you thinking about it and um, considering taking the next step for your company, wherever you may be on the scale. And at this time, we'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Tina. <clears throat> that was very fascinating. So you can certainly chat, drop something into the chat bo uh, box or you can unmute yourself <clears throat> and ask Tina a question. And Stephen uh, had a question in the chat. Can you see that, Tina? I'm going to stop sharing so I could get back to the chat. There we go. Okay. Do you have any data requiring how large the United States cyber aggressions are compared to China's? <laughs> well, here's something really interesting. In fact, I have a slide. Let me share this slide with you. Uh, go back to sharing my screen. Yeah, Zoom's not super easy. <laughs> There you go. Oh, it's okay. You just have to get used to it. We use Microsoft Teams because Zoom had all those privacy and security questions. Um, I don't have data specific to your question of China's cyber attacks versus the United States cyber attacks. I imagine that the threat maps can tell you like how many times China has attacks versus the United States, but I'm not sure that China publicizes their attacks and level of tax it probably as publicly as the United States does. But this is very interesting. Our US Marine Corps has 186,000 active personnel. That's just the Marine Corps. China has 180,000 cyber warriors. That's as big as our entire Marine Corps. I, I don't have it written down here, but I think our cyber warrior um, size is more in the range of 10 to 15,000 for our military cyber warfare. So China is putting a lot of money, a lot of effort into their cyber espionage, and they are putting the people behind it to fight against us. So I thought that was an interesting slide to show but I can't tell you I know. I, I do know we're attacking China all the time. We're attacking Russia just as much as they are. Um, a very interesting book to read is called uh, The Dark Territory, I believe I read, which is the history of, of cyber um, security. And again, I'll look it up and send it to Brian. That's good. What else questions you guys have about security? now that you've heard a little bit more. Well, I, I want to ask you, you mentioned the 99% of two-way security, it's 99% more secure. Uh, no, it's over 95% of the defense supply chain are not compliant oh, with, okay, the, with the DFARS cybersecurity clause. That but I think seven. you also talked about the two-factor authentication for you. Yeah, oh, I think that's yeah. where you're yeah. going with it. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. So Microsoft says that, and I think I have a, I don't need to first show it up, but let me check my note real quick because it's a certain type. Um, Microsoft says that multi-factor authentication will block up to 99% of automated yeah, attacks. Decides automated attacks. Yeah, and it's getting easier to implement multi-factor authentication. There's lots of tools out there and, you know, open source software and you can hook up to Google and <clears throat> I think it's a lot easier to deploy that than it used to be. It's just a pain to your users sometimes. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering about because often the two-way authentication says, okay, give me your cell phone number, I send you a text message and this authenticates. So I think a possible hacker can do the same thing. Just put any 
any uh, phone number in there. Some of the systems, they have a pre-registered phone number and they're using them. Right, obviously that's one of the hacks that somebody can do is get in and change the phone number for that, yeah. that text number. Um, we use an authenticator application app a lot for logging into our network. Um, instead of a, a number sent to a cell phone, we use an authenticator app. Okay. Yeah, and just like a you know multi-factor, uh, as it states, you can do it, you know, cell phone, email, you know, there's multi-factors that you can use. You can use different avenues. Yeah, an interesting trend I'm seeing is companies are actually getting away from passwords completely. In yeah. order to log in, they send you an email and you can't access the system until you click on that email, which yeah. is an interesting direction. If you go to reset your Gmail password, they'll actually, if you have a Samsung phone, they'll actually just send you, you know, what number did we just send you? And then you type it in. Yeah. And the recommendation for passwords right now is long passphrases as opposed to shorter passwords with different characters and numbers, but um, longer passphrases. Tina, what's your thoughts on something like using LastPass where basically all your information is in one uh, place? I use LastPass and that is the recommendation is to use a password application like Pass LastPass one of the things it does do is generate the passwords for you. Um, I am just as guilty as everybody else of having that one password and one username that I use on every website. And I've been diligently over the last six months changing all my passwords to unique, unique passwords. Hmm. Um, there's a great website. If you Google Haystack passwords, there's a great website where you can put in a password combination and it'll tell you basically how long it'll take for a password app to crack it. Um, so it gives you an, a concept of how much it changes the longer the password you go. But, but databases, these uh, breaches, what they do is there's a database that just keeps growing and growing and growing of every known combination of username and password. So when hackers get in and use these password um, tools, password cracking tools, they get access to these databases of every known password combination. And that's the first thing these password tools go through is go through that database. So it's very important because if they get one, if they get your password for one website, they could potentially get into all your websites if you're using the same password. And the only way to really control and manage a unique password for every website is through a password um, like LastPass. And like I said, that's what I use. That's what we use in our company. And I've been slowly setting up my whole family for LastPass. What about using, um, what is it, uh, VPNs and hiding your IP address? I mean, are there, that kind of throws off some of the um, authentication systems a little bit. Like, I'll just tell you what I do. So I have to get into my client's Amazon account. Well, if I can pick the IP address that I log into one time, I just have to go back to the IP address each time and it doesn't break the red flag for Amazon. Amy, you want to address that? I see you showing up. I know um, we use a VPN. So when I'm traveling on the road, um, I access the internet through the hotspot off my cell phone. I do not use public Wi-Fi's. I use the hotspot off my phone and then I go in through a VPN. Um, and that's very common. And I think for your remote workers and setting up remote workers, VPN is really what you want to set up. It's the most, it's going to be the most secure way for them to access your company. And either Jeff or Amy, who are really the experts in IT, if they want to add to that, please feel free. <laughs> I had to pop off. I was in the middle of uh, making dinner. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's what those pans were in the background. Yeah, I, I thought I had it muted. I had it on camera. I was ready to talk and then I didn't. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, VPN is the best practice. But um, I wanted to, to share back the key thing um, that I think is interesting around uh, what Cyber States, our research project that's funded by NIST from CompTIA, that if you go to cyberstates.org, you can see by uh, geography, where the jobs are, where the shortfalls are, and what certifications are asked. Tina, we've been uh, crossing paths a lot nationally on, on investment and workforce. And 
Um, are you encouraged? Do you see change coming to help close that gap when we have such yeah, a limited a, number of graduates for so many needed jobs? Do you, are you encouraged or question. discouraged at this point? That's, I'm encouraged and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, first off, let me mention the apprenticeship effort. Um, apprenticeships are the government, let's just say the government of the United States has determined that apprenticeships, similar to what is used in Europe and other countries, are really a successful way to provide that on the on the job work-based learning opportunity. And as, as we know in the United States, apprenticeships to us are the plumbers and the tradesmen and not tech industry. And so for the last two years, as we've been researching apprenticeships, usually you bring up the A word and companies and employers run for the hills and, and don't want to even have that conversation. Um, another couple things that are happening on the day that President Trump um, signed an executive order that defiling um, public monuments is a crime that can come with a, a fine, that morning he signed another executive agreement uh, order, which unfortunately did not get advertised very well. But that morning he signed an executive order that federal jobs would level the playing field by, for federal jobs, they would no longer require degrees, that they would focus on skills and open up the opportunity for um, not just the elite to get jobs, but for everybody to get jobs. And there's an effort toward that across the industry. In fact, the Aspen Cybersecurity Group, which is a subgroup of the Aspen Institute, a research organization, the Aspen Cybersecurity Group has now is now up to 31 companies have signed off and agree to lessen their requirements to provide more diversity and more um, people getting into the field. So you have companies like Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, um, Apple, Facebook, um, uh, I can't think of all of them. I could, again, I could put that in the, um, I'm going to make a list of things to send out to Brian that he could send you guys for follow up. But basically what they've agreed to do is to focus on skills, not degrees. So again, what, what you're seeing in job requirements is this request for bachelor's or master's degree, a CISSP. There are companies, sorry, that's my dog. Companies are requiring a CISSP for job requirements and they're asking for two years of experience. Jeff or Amy, what's the problem with that? A CISSP, you can't even sit for it until you have how many until years? Have. It's five, isn't it? It's five, but they're asking for it even at an entry level job level. And yeah. this is actually, if you guys know Dan Weeks, this is some of the research he's been putting out there, is that even for um, experience of one to two years, they're saying we want to see a CISSP. So HR requirements are completely misleading in the market. And what everybody's realizing, uh, IBM has coined the term new collar worker, which is a tech savvy individual without a college degree. So uh, boot camps such as Full Stack, what Full Stack is offering through Cal Poly's Extended Ed, they're actually in five universities across um, California now, or uh, Code Slow does a boot camp, or you have um, community colleges offering two-year degrees or just certification pathways. Um, the most entry level is a security plus requirement for entry level. So the market is changing where industry is starting to recognize that cybersecurity requirements for talent could be met without that bachelor's or master's degree. And that we need to start opening up for this new collar type of worker. And our whole project is all about, you know, giving those, those entry level candidates coming out of any type of education program, that opportunity for work based learning. Um, the other thing that's happening in the HR industry is we've talked to different people from Vandenberg Air Force Base to uh, Raytheon to Booz Allen Hamilton that um, companies are starting to recognize that they can't expect that the employees are always going to be come to them for fully ready that they need to play a bigger part in training and i love what amy's term is amy's term is um 
bench strength, building up your bench strength. So as in, in the challenge in cybersecurity talent is because everybody's poaching them, you have high turnover. So even if you do bring somebody in and you train them, there's always a fear that they're going to go off to the next best offer. And so um, investing in them early in their career brings more retainability. It builds your, your bench strength. So if you do lose any of your um, senior talent, then you have that bench strength coming in. Um, the other focus to meet the need is really upskilling your IT workers. And IT is very different than cyber. Um, they don't always translate. An IT individual doesn't always make a good cybersecurity tech, but we're working with companies that run assessments and help you identify which of your existing IT talent is prime and a good candidate for upskilling to cybersecurity. So hopefully that answers the question, but overall I am encouraged. The conversations we're having with employers is very positive. Um, we just need to see it translate into actual open job recs and or apprenticeship opportunities for these candidates. Yeah, and I appreciate that. What you're saying, I agree with you. It is. I'm more optimistic than I was. I think COVID has accelerated it. So mm -hmm. we'll be working together on that a lot. Tina, have you heard of any instances where like Chrome extensions are exposing people? You know, there's like some sneaky ways that hackers can kind of get into your system that I don't know how well Google is really protecting us from. <laughs> well, world. Google is not, a, we are not allowed to use Google tools in our company. So mm -hmm. we are not fans of Google, but I can't answer that question. Maybe Amy or Jeff who, who watch that kind of stuff or somebody else on the line. I'm not a techie is in that terms as far as software and cybersecurity goes. Um, I don't keep abreast on all the latest, but I'm sure you can research it and find lots of writings about it. But Google was started, you know, my president always reminds me that Google was started by basically saying, here, we'll give you free email. And you sign an agreement that says they have the right to everything, all your privacy. And that's how they make their business. Yeah. Well, I think, Tina, you raise a good point. Our company, uh, CompTIA and Cleverbeck, both don't endorse having Google products, but the, I think that the philosophy is so different, you know, go fast and break things is sort of that mentality. Like you said, you know, here it's free email, go fast and break things. That doesn't really align with best practice security. And I think that's where we're learning a new culture. Mm -hmm. Good answer. Anything else out there, you guys, for Tina? And it's interesting that uh, it could be an interesting topic. Um, and Perhaps that's part, a part of it, Tina, is you, you have to attract people to something that seems like a kind of a boring topic. It's not as, you know, exciting, but there, there is. And when you think about the fact that China and Russia, you know, have the potential to really nail us, like yeah. we haven't even seen this beginning of it, have we? <laughs> yeah. Well, the interesting thing is the cyber, uh, FBI kept mentioning about how they're building this big database on all of us. You know, you could almost guarantee your name and email address and information on you is in the dark web. And I asked them, I said, well, what are they building this database for? And the reason why they're building that database is if they could find people who are vulnerable that they can exploit, they will. So if you are working at a company that's doing research for COVID-19 and they find out that your wife has cancer and you're in financial trouble because of healthcare bills, they will use that to exploit to offer you money to exchange secrets. And that's what they're building their databases to exploit people. And they found that uh, universities are starting to get smarter about China's plans. But one of the things they do is they'll hire US researchers to come over and to China and do a research project. And it won't have anything to do with the classified work they do back in the United States. But what do they do? They pack up their university computer, they put it in their backpack, they travel to China, and as soon as they get in China's borders, everything on that computer and cell phone is ripped off and duplicated. So if you ever go to China, make sure you take a burner phone and do not take your computer that has classified information on it. But it is, it is interesting. It's, it's, it's fascinating when you hear that how patient China is and what they're doing. Well, it's made, raised my concern or <laughs> awareness. So you achieved that with me for sure. Well, you know, the challenge is that um, 
and you know, I've been in cybersecurity now for three years, started with Cal Poly's cybersecurity, um, California Cybersecurity Institute out there at National Guard Base. And as small businesses, we, you know, it's kind of like Central Coast people. We're, we're in our little bubble here and we tend to have that attitude of it can't happen to me or I'm not important enough for somebody to steal my information, right? And I think we, you know, what the reports come out year after year after year constantly of how many hits are happening to small business. And unfortunately, when you're a small business, you may not be able to recover from a cyber attack like a large company. Um, cyber insurance, this is another point to why you should take it seriously for your company. Cyber insurance, more companies are, are mm. getting cyber insurance. In fact, for some executives and CISOs that we've talked to, they look at it as a financial decision. And sometimes it's like, well, I'll just pay insurance. And if I get a breach, the insurance will take care of it. I probably won't really lose any of my customers because after all, did Target lose any of their customers after their breach? But um, cyber insurers are now starting to require that you have certain cybersecurity controls in place for them to insure you. So that comes back to something like that CMMC um, model security certificate that if they start implementing those practices or say you have to meet NIST 800-171 or you have to meet these certain types of controls, the top 20, you could look up what the top 20 controls are, then you're going to have to have that requirement and prove that you meet those controls before you could get insured. Another thing is, because anybody tell me how did Target get hacked? What was the door in? Anybody know? It was through the HVAC company that was servicing them. So they had a vulnerability through their supplier. So you can't just look at your company, you have to look at your complete supply chain. Hmm. So well, on how connected we are with everybody, you think about Dropbox, I, I probably have about 50 clients shared Dropboxes with them and who knows what's on their computers, right? So just, just because I love telling you what I've learned um, what CMTC for like the Department of Defense, it's very expensive to implement all the controls that they want you to implement. And so what the recommendation is, is seg segmentation. And the, the funny thing is, is Paul Shaw, who's with the Defense Acquisition University, he does all the training. He was talking to a top honcho at DOD and DOD was like, he was like, Oh, come on, nobody has controlled unclassified information in the cloud because, of course, nobody would do that. Who would put something in the cloud that they know could be vulnerable? Well, probably 100% of small companies are putting everything in the cloud. And to them, they think it's so ludicrous that they don't even imagine that the supply chain would do that. And that's just how, to, how out of sync they are with really understanding the 14 levels of the supply chain. And so segmentation is what's recommended. So your most vulnerable information should be kept in a local server and you should only put things in the cloud that are not vulnerable because then you could build your controls around your vulnerable information and protect that and not have to worry with as much controls on the stuff that aren't critical. So if you think about you, you know, your most valuable information as a company, what is that and how would you protect it? And um, they even talk about multi-layers. So some, one guy said seven layer deep was recommended. And what that means is that only giving access to that controlled important information in your company, like it, it could be a drawing for, you know, a part that, um, you know, let, let me, I don't know, like maybe it goes on a drone or maybe your IP technology that you don't want anybody to have in those design documents. Um, only let people have access to that who actually need it. So don't put it out on a server where all employees have access, but only some. I mentioned that example of the submarine. Um, what they did is they had the Chinese professor, they enlisted him to start a company, and then he tried to hire away the employees from, I can't remember the name of the company, but the company that makes this foam that we're the only ones in the world, and this is the only company in the world that makes this foam that allows our submarines to be silent and undetectable. And in that foam are some little ball things. They're like these little balls that are part of the foam. So this guy created this company and he tried to hire away 
the the he used to work at the company and he knew some of the employees so he tried to hire some of the employees they wouldn't come over so he hired some ex employees four ex employees and he wasn't able to get all the research for the entire foam but he was able to get the design and research and documentation for the little balls whatever they are so he took it back to china china developed it and then started selling it for less money and to compete against us and the way that they uncovered it is our government, the US government worked with Lockheed Martin to put out a fake RFP. And so this company bid on the RFP and when they had the uh, Chinese group come over to present, they found out that they were actually working for the Chinese uh, military. And so they were able to capture the information that way. But that's just an example of what they'll, the ends that they'll go to to steal the information. So all leave right. you on yeah. that, it's all fascinating. We'll keep our guard up and report anything, any, any, see something, say something, people. All right, any, anything else? I like to respect everybody's time. I appreciate you guys coming tonight. Uh, any last words? You can unmute yourself. Any announcements? Anything? I have one more question for Tina. Um, first of all, great presentation and great discussion. That was, that was really fun. Um, but am I right in understanding there's kind of a new industry uh, that's jumping up now surrounding security um, for certification and insurance and training and consulting that uh, is growing as we speak? Well, it's not a new industry. I can tell you one of the hotbeds is becoming one of those assessors um, for the CMMC. So a lot of companies like Jeff and Amy's cyber provider or uh, MSP companies are trying to get certified to become an assessment company to do that certification. Um, I wouldn't say it's a new industry. I mean, Amy's part of CompTIA now. Um, so CompTIA is being around that sets those certifications. Um, I think in general, th there's the leaders in those standards. I mean, there's SANS, there's CompTIA, and there's others. Um, and there's common certifications that everybody looks for in the industry. So I think that's been pretty set. Amy might be able to address it more from the CompTIA perspective. Um, training is a big issue, but again, it's not new. They've been doing that. I think what's new is that um, we underestimate our youth. And what what's new is it being pushed down to earlier levels. So for example, we have middle school students getting IT Fundamentals Plus, and we have some high school and middle school teachers that are even trying to get A plus at like an eighth grade level. But if you do A plus at ninth grade, Network Plus at 10th grade and Security Plus, we have students graduating out of high school with 10 degrees, I mean, 10 certifications, A plus, Network Plus, um, Security Plus, Cisco CCNA, some Microsoft certs, and they're two classes short of an AA degree. So what's really new is trying to build the cybersecurity pathways in the, in the high schools. Um, there's a task force in California to define a cybersecurity K through 20 um, curriculum pathway. And one of the things they're coming out with in California is a dual bachelor's degree for computer science and cybersecurity, and it includes an apprenticeship component. So they, in order to get that dual cert, uh, batch, baccalaureate, you'd have to have an apprenticeship component to it. So- Tina, like you're a wealth of information, but I do wanna chime in on how long it's been around. You know, I think uh, you can always blame the lawyers. And uh, <clears throat> I say that, of course, tongue in cheek, because I found them to be so useful. I became one five years ago, but the, um, the lawyers have really driven this home, right? Liability drives a lot of stuff. And so does military compliance. So um, when we start seeing people requiring this for insurance coverage and this training and these certifications that you're asking about, that's been the real shift, I think, in the last couple of years. And legislation um, around that is really uh, driving the, the game. CompTIA has been in, around for 30 years, training and working on certifications. But I think, um, you know, you, you put liability and dollars on the line and then you get changed. I think that's kind of uh, an interesting thing to think about. Well, new privacy standards as well. And I, you know, one of the things we're trying to make sure people understand in the conversation is there's a need for cyber hygiene training for mm -hmm. everybody. 
at all levels. And that needs to start with our children all the way up to our grandparents, right? To our elderly. And that's general cyber hygiene. And there's a lot of conversations about how to implement that into the school curriculum. Um, we think it'd be great in the health class, but um, the, um, the Cyberspace Solarium Commission kept mentioning civics, which we don't call it civics in California. We call it social studies, I guess, but implementing cyber hygiene. But cyber hygiene is different than cybersecurity. And California is really leading the way. We have a couple programs that have four-year cybersecurity pathways in the high school. And a lot of times when people talk about cybersecurity being implemented into um, education, they think of just one cybersecurity module in a computer science course. But we're talking full four-year pathways of cybersecurity, starting with computer science, but ending with a, a two years, at least two years of focused cybersecurity education. And that's where I'm talking about these students coming out with some of their certifications coming out of high school. Well, there's certainly job security for those kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. The, um, the kind of analogy I was thinking about was like the International Standards Organization, um, how you know, there's been quality for uh, quality assurance and quality departments for a long time, but until ISO kind of came around and certified other bodies to then have businesses to certify uh, you know, businesses, um, it, it, I don't think I've seen the same um, explosion professionalism and certification until they came along. And I, I didn't know that it existed already um, in the uh, security industry. Maybe it has, but it sounds like with CMMC, um, that level is now coming around as well. Well, the, um, a lot of the cybersecurity controls fall under NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And one of the things that came out, I don't, I don't know how many years NICE has been around. I would say four years maybe but the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. And they've come out with a cybersecurity workforce framework because cybersecurity in job requirements is a fairly new industry. And what one person calls a cybersecurity analyst and another person calls a cybersecurity analyst may not be the same thing. And so they've defined the knowledge, skills, abilities, and tasks and align them with the job roles so that what, what they're asking businesses to do is to align your job roles to the NICE framework and so that we're speaking the same language. And as educators start to, um, like CompTIA, they align their certifications with those KSAs. So when you get, you know, a Security Plus or a CYSA or even a CISSP from ISC, you know, it, it could align to the NICE framework to say that you know you have these KSAs to line up to it. So there's a lot of work being done in the workforce side of it, um, but the, the certifications have been around for a while. And one of the challenges that's happening is that the industry is being driven by certification so much that we see students coming out of universities with a, a bachelor's or master's degree, but no certification and the first thing companies tell us they do is get them to a security plus. And so, uh, or students have to go get their own certifications after they graduate from a university because those certifications are required in the job, job skill requirements. Um, we've had other employers just kind of to keep in your mind saying, you know, we don't care about degrees. We don't care about certs. What we care about is, is your portfolio. And they're looking to hackathons and GitHub and cyber competitions to find out what you did. And we've even seen, I think it's CloudStrike, or I think it's CloudStrike who hired a full team from a hackathon. Um, like they hired the whole team because the team worked so well together that they hired one of the top teams to come work for them. That's very encouraging. Yeah. We're well past our time, but I'm happy to answer questions, but I wanna be sensitive if people need to drop off. All right, you guys, I don't think so, Tina. You've been great. And like I said, it's been a surprisingly interesting topic for me. <laughs> oh, good. Well, I hope yeah, everybody great. gets to take something away and I'll send out the, the slides and links to things that we've talked about for you to browse at your leisure. All right, everyone. Hey, thank Have you very much, Tina. Thank Have a great month. Bye. I'll see you next Thanks, month. Thanks, Tina. Thank you. Stay well, everybody. Bye. Bye. Tina. Thanks.